Mm -hmm. All right, our next speaker is Debbie Levitt. She is a UX designer and is going to be talking to us about how we can incorporate better UX design into our dev tool chains. Okay, am I on? Take it away. Can people hear me? Okay, because I'm known for being so quiet and shy. Okay, uh, so let's get started because uh, I've got 11.07. I know I've got a fixed amount of time and a guy telling me these things. So this is DevOps ICU, improving DevOps results by correctly integrating UX. Now I'm not a DevOps expert. I like to show up to these and say, I'd like a cloud with a container with a cloud on it. Uh, I am a UX specialist as uh, I've been doing that since the mid 90s. Who remembers the mid 90s? <laughs> Woo, people of a certain age, okay. So, and this guy. And so, my dining partner from last night. So, uh, and of course, you, I'm here in America this time, so uh, you know that ICU is the intensive care unit. Now, UX can't fix everything in, in your DevOps and software development universe, but I'm here to tell you how it can make your lives certainly easier. I'll be your DevOps ICU doctor. And my company is called P-Type, short for prototype, because I love to make a lot of UX prototypes. And we also work with companies on how they can better integrate UX uh, into their processes and hiring and things like that. Uh, and of course, you're welcome to add me on LinkedIn. Please do. And this boils my two-day DevOps ICU program down to about 30, 35 minutes. So if you feel like I missed something, I probably have. This is the minimum viable presentation. And uh, unfortunately, because I have a flight right after this, I am literally running out the door. A lift will be waiting for me, so I want to answer your questions, but I might not be physically here. So please email me, message me on LinkedIn, use the Menti uh, system, find me. I want to hear your horror stories and your UX woes and, uh, and give you a free therapy hour and help you out as much as I can. So I apologize that I'm running out right after this, after changing into comfortable yoga pants. So. Uh, please feel free to tweet. I find my, uh, I usually don't give the slides out later, but you're welcome to take photos of them. And a lot of people use uh, slides with animations and transitions, and you never know when to take a picture. So for good user experience, when you see the little camera, which is green for the non-colorblind and gray for the colorblind, you will know that it's a great time to take a picture of this slide because it's done animating. So find me on Twitter as well, though I might see it tomorrow. I'm not a big tweety person. And some people ask if this session is just a sales pitch for UX, and that's kind of a strange question because you, you came here, you came to me. Uh, I'm not here to sell it to you. Hopefully you're already buying, but you know that you've had some struggles and confusions and you need some tips, so I'm, I'm here to give those. Uh, so jumping in, at many companies, engineering is fed by other teams. Uh, they've got blueprints, ideas, concepts, hopefully even wireframes and prototypes that are coming from outside the engineering team. And these, of course, are coming from individuals who want to collaborate with engineering, hopefully. I'm out at the UX conferences reminding the UX people to also collaborate. But engineering doesn't operate in a vacuum. However, I've noticed that there are a lot of software dev methodologies that seem to leave UX out. Uh, you rarely find UX really explained or detailed in agile training and other methodologies, and that's left a lot of companies not sure where UX fits in. But uh, I'm here to tell you how they fit in and that we don't just draw boxes on a page. There's a lot more to know uh, because expert UX architects will be researching, designing, testing, and iterating on everything between someone saying, I have an idea, and someone else saying, let's get it to developers to be built. So at least to me, DevOps is about so much more than just how developers connect with IT and how infrastructure is managed or how frameworks can be improved. It's about recognizing how many people and teams are really part of the software development process and making sure that they're all at the table because their roles really are very intertwined. I found that developers and engineering do want to be a part of product and UX and creative teams while we're designing, but that seems to be left out of a lot of definitions, even of DevOps. And of course, UX, we want to be part of the engineering process and be there for you when there are questions and ambiguities, yet a lot of methodologies say they're just outside consultants and you don't really need them. So these are silos we need to break down. 
all your customer experiences is your user experience. That's it. They don't know if you had a thousand developers or if you're lean or agile or avalanche or something else. And you're a user too, and you may have selected this system, you may have wished you didn't have to select this system, and, but all these software and systems have competitors. What made you choose the ones that you chose? And when you use a system you don't like, are you thinking, I wonder how many sprints that took? Well, no, you're not. You're thinking, who built this piece of junk? And, and you might use some stronger words, and you're totally right. Who designed this product? Who researched with users like you to make sure that it was something that was going to solve real problems and needs that you have? And was this tested on people like you before it was unleashed on the public? UX is driven by some of the same results that DevOps wants. We're problem finders, problem solvers, customer advocates, and we are driven, if not obsessed, with product quality and building what customers really need. We care about teams working efficiently, and we really want to see the tell your friends it's great, easy to learn, easy to use products getting to market as fast as possible. So enhancing this relationship should save time, money, and sanity. Let's take a look at where UX can fit into your world. Can I ask a quick show of hands, how many people are working at companies where they do not have any UX teammates? UX just hasn't been a part of their complete breakfast. Okay, a few. So this next slide might feel like you. Again, therapy hour available. So normally in a process without UX, it looks like this. The client, the product manager, the CEO, whoever has the vision is going to tell you, the engineers, what that vision is. You build it, you test it, you get it on some sort of server, and wouldn't you know, that person sees it and goes, now that I see this, I've changed my mind. Well, now you've got to cycle back and go, okay, swear words excluded, what do you want now? Fine, we'll build it, we'll test it, we'll get it back on the server. And this seems to cycle over and over until someone says, well, just release it, get it out there for customers. And you have to cross all the fingers you have and make sure it's not a disaster and no one's blaming you. If you had UX as part of your process, the sunny, happier uh, version would be that uh, that client, the product person, the CEO, the CEO's life partner, whoever has the idea for this product goes to UX. UX then cycles through its formalized process, which I'll describe in a moment, and we can then uh, research, design, test, and iterate, make sure this is a really good solution for our target customers and not just what the CEO wanted today, and then we can finally wrap this up after it tests well and deliver it to engineering so that you can build it once. That's the goal, to make sure you're just building it once. And that way, if the client or product person or vision person has a change of mind, they have to come back to me. And that's when I get all New York on them. No, uh, the, only in select uh, instances. They have to go through me, and sometimes their change might be a good idea, and sometimes I talk them out of the change. M might be a poor idea. We don't have to build poor ideas. Heads up. Um, but the great thing is that because for where I am in the process, I'm just working in wireframes and prototypes. Engineering hasn't written a line of code. So if someone changes their mind, you're not bogged down with change requests. I can just iterate my wireframes and prototypes, retest, and then pack that up and get it to you. So it should be a dreamy dream world that looks like this. <sighs> Can you smell the free conference food of the beauty of building something only once? That would be great. That's my dream for you. It's probably your dream for you. And that way you don't have to struggle with the people who keep changing their minds. Uh, this slide says, what is UX? Um, but I did this talk in Italy recently and decided to regionalize it. And it made me so happy that I've kept it. So this just says, what is UX with a beloved Italian cartoon character. Uh, so what is UX? Uh, I find that when I do a lot of these engineering events, not everybody knows, and that's okay. That's why I'm here. UX is the more scientific, psychological, and problem-solving side of product experience and service design. Our chief goals include happier, more loyal customers, ease of learning and use, shorter, more intuitive processes, and accessibility for people who might have vision, hearing, mobility, cognitive, and other issues. 
So quick accessibility note. Who remembers this football game from almost three years ago? Anybody remember this one? Yeah, one person, two, few people. Yeah, someone's already laughing. They know it's coming. So Nike got creative with the uniforms, which made the news and seemed really cool. I'll put that in air quotes. But what happened was uh, by the next day they were being uh, pooped on quite publicly because this is how the game looked to the colorblind. So to people who are red-green colorblind, which some estimate at 2% of women and almost 8% of men, which means statistically speaking, there's probably four or so of you in the room right now who are colorblind. Usually at this point, people wave at me and nod at me and say, yes, I am colorblind. So those last two slides would have looked the same. And this is why you think, well, UX, they just draw boxes on a page. We do so much more. Everything that we design should be colorblind friendly, work for people with hearing issues, et cetera. So uh, even NFL, uh, former NFL players were tweeting, I can't follow this game, I'm colorblind. So heads up. So a little bit about the user-centered design process. We really do have a formalized process. Um, unfortunately, not everybody who's put UX on their resume uses it, but when you get back to your workplace, you will now be able to tell the imposters from the real thing. So black box revealed. So this is a short session, so I'm going to just hit a couple of high notes here. This is a bit of a drive-by look at the user-centered design process. It's got lots of steps, and of course we start with requirements. And that's where UX should start collaborating with engineering right away. I don't want to know later that I designed something that can't be built. So I want to find out early what technical limitations there might be, if we have all of our API calls in place, if we need special services for these things. These these conversations need to, to happen earlier. Oh, and it's got narrow. <laughs> okay, and then also research is a very important part of what UX does. A lot of companies like to skimp on it or they think, ah, some of our marketing people did research, but our approach is very different and sadly I don't have the time to go into huge detail, but it's not user-centered without users. We research with real or archetypal customers and we find out more about them because statistics and quantitative data are great, but UX wants to know the qualitative data. We want to know why. When you walked out of that airport bathroom and you hit the sad face, okay, so I can tell you X percent of people hit the sad face, but I want to know why because then I know what to fix. Otherwise, maybe sad face was my day sucks, sad face. Well, I, sorry, sir, I can't help you. So information architecture has to do with structure, hierarchies, and taxonomies. These uh, typically have to do with na site navigation and menus, but can also be databases and how people will be able to find things in databases like our customers on an e-commerce site, how they'll be able to find that. There is someone, there are people who specialize just in that. It is a cousin of library sciences. So if you have that weird cousin who decided to go to college for library sciences, they could have a future in UX or in a library. Interaction design is what all y'all think of when I say UX. This is when we do our wireframes and prototypes and those types of blueprints. This is where we're designing the interfaces and how things are going to lay out and work and the steps that people are going to take. Uh, so there's so much involved here. And now it goes to user testing, which happens during our process and before engineering writes a line of code. Because I don't want engineering to start building something if I'm not sure it's what's going to be built. Because user testing always brings to light flaws. Even when I think I've designed something amazing, there's someone there just like QA testing. You think the code is amazing, QA tester finds something, and okay, we gotta fix that. And that happens in UX too, and we should be, another way to tell imposters, we should be low ego. We should, we should be able to say, hooray, that tested badly, that person found that problem, I get to fix it before everybody suffers with it. That should be a hooray and not an ego moment and then we will go back and fix it. So that's the short version of our process, micro short. And also micro short, I wanna talk a little bit about UX and lean. Um, the next thing I'm gonna pull up is an interactive poll. So if you guys have your phones or laptops handy, please go to menti.com. I have to swing over and click activate, very sad. UX. Um, I didn't design the polling system. So uh, you can go to menti.com, M-E-N-T-I, put in 88752. 
And I want to talk about minimum viable products by taking a look at our minimum viably dressed jogger. Because UX is usually disagreeing with product and engineering on how MVP we MVP our MVP. So I want to ask your opinion, which is the minimum viable jogging outfit? And these, these results should come up live if I'm on the internet, so please do, oh, here we go, peeps voting, great. There's always someone who votes for number three because they think they're a rebel, and heads up, uh, every time I do this talk, someone votes for number three, that means you're not a rebel, you're completely predictable. Except I don't know which one of you it is, but I, I could try to guess. That would be fun if I started trying to guess who, who the rebel is. So this is great, so 18 of you have already voted, thank you so much, you can continue playing along. And I find that in many of my audiences, people do vote for number one because they say that is the minimum viable jogging outfit. But UX would say the middle one is the better choice, not only for, for jogging reasons, but because we want to make sure that we're releasing something that has customer value. And that's because you never get a second chance to make a first impression. Who remembers that commercial? Someone my age? Come on. All right. You never get a second chance to make a first impression, and that's especially true for when your customer first installs your app or visits your site or tries out your system. Is this going to be too lean for them to really use or enjoy or get fish hooked on? <laughs> yes, I write my own stuff. Remember, you're running the risk that customers think you're just bad at this. Uh, because if people are turned off by whatever you're calling an MVP or a beta, are they going to reinstall when they hear you've updated or changed it? Do you do that? Do you give a lot of second and third chances to companies when you feel like they've alienated you? Most people don't. So that's why for UX, the V in MVP stands for valuable. We are less concerned with how microscopic this can be and more concerned with Yes, let's make it as small as we can, but it still has to have value for the customers or we run the risk of alienating them even if we tell them this is an MVP or a beta. They don't care, they expect it to just work. And take it from Eric, Mr. Lean, even if you're not doing lean, because he said, what if we found ourselves building something nobody wanted? In that case, what did it matter if we did it on time and on budget? So. Going too lean and minimal, you might be building what people really don't want. It might not solve their problems, and they might look to a competitor who does. So your UX expert should be involved to help product and engineering prioritize stories and features to find that balance. UX and agile, oh, buckle seat belts, oh, gosh. Okay, everybody, be careful. Okay, I'm going to use safe agile in some of my examples. Uh, they're a little bit of an easy target. Um, but uh, know that everything that I'm saying can be adapted to other forms of agile and software development. They're just a bit of an easy target for me. Once upon a time, I went for four days of safe agile training. I have since recovered, thank you for asking. And I asked them, Do you, can you tell me where in your model UX fits in? This was about 2014. They said, we have no idea, and if you figure it out, please tell us. <laughs> and I died a little. And last year I emailed them, about a year ago, and I said, I figured it out and I want to tell you, and they kind of mansplained me and wouldn't write me back. So, um, I ba so I said to them, well, I'm going to tour the world telling people you're wrong and you'll just have to be embarrassed into changing. And I've heard that they've started releasing articles like, well, maybe UX is more important than we first said, so maybe, maybe I'm accomplishing my goals here. So. Uh, in more recent versions of SAFE, they've now given UX a little recycle your garbage icon in the island of misfit toys that is the left side of their model. This is, I mean, what's in there? System team, vision, roadmap, shared services, metrics, and lean UX. Only the people d designing everything you're building. And, but that doesn't tell me anything, doesn't tell you anything. Who are these people? How are they involved? Are they on the Agile team? Are they sprinting? Are they something else? So this is still extremely lacking in my opinion. <sighs> it hurts. So where does UX fit into Agile based on my work experience and what I've seen work and not work? First of all, nobody puts UX in a corner. <laughs> Here's where UX really lives. We're here in portfolio land, involved in what we're building, why we're building it, and prioritizing what we're building. 
UX lives here in continuous exploration, that process of researching and assessing what market, the market and customers need and making sure we're building features and we have a roadmap and vision that really satisfy those customers. We live here. Which one's that? Solutions. Oh my gosh, all, all I live for are customer solutions. That's it, completely. I would love to make DevOps better in my own wacky external kind of way. Um, we would love to improve and enhance the culture. And we're all about decreasing failure rates, though we're thinking more on the human experience level, less on the technical bug level. Uh, because better UX design earlier, fewer fixes later. And if you ask me, one UX designer should be on the Agile team. That person is uh, involved in everything, meeting, sprinting along with you. They're not an outside consultant. They're not someone who throws something over the fence at you. They are true collaborators who you're going to need to work with every day, especially where there are questions and ambiguities. And I believe that they should be embedded or at least semi-embedded with, with teams. So we are all over this thing. I find that people who aren't sure where UX fits into Agile usually aren't that aware of what UX does. They're not aware of that user-centered desi design process and all of the tasks that go into it and how much time that can take. So this is what I believe in. Again, this is opinion. Everybody's got one, and you'll find people saying different things. But based on my experience in UX, I've found that what works best is for UX to go through its research, design, iterations, then pass that to the visual designers. Now, it's easy for me to say that because I'm not an artist. Yes, that's right, everybody. You've met a UX professional who doesn't claim to do visual design. I am a terrible artist. I have a degree in music after dropping pre-med. And so, um, so I'm a, I was a math and science chick who ended up I in this world. And, it's very, and UX is very sciencey. I am a terrible artist. All of my smiley faces have perms. And um, so it's easier for me to separate UX and UI, which I do have a slide about. So I like to make sure the UX is solid before sending it to have its visual design done. Because if the UX is still flawed, I don't want to have wasted the visual designer's time. And I don't want great visual design to mask a UX flaw. And then we want to get it over to engineering. So we need to usually be two or more sprints ahead. And just like engineering can uh, have a problem in a sprint, somebody was out sick, uh, more bugs than we expected, there's always ways for things to go wrong. Same can happen with UX. I take something to testing, it's got more problems than I anticipated, I need a little more time. And for that, I recommend getting lots of tech stories, technical debt, refactoring other things into that backlog so that if I find that I need more time, I don't just get this. I don't need that, that doesn't help. So, and you wouldn't want that. So instead of just being glared at, it would be great if people had some uh, stories and tech debt that they can work on while I take a little bit more time because sometimes we're just surprised by what's found in user testing. That's why we do it. So remember your Agile Manifesto principles. Who has a favorite Agile Manifesto principle? Anyone here? No, collect them all? No, trading cards? Okay. So I love principle one, our highest priority is to satisfy the customer. So of course that's directly related to how valuable, delightful, easy to learn, easy to use, and life changing your product is. Give motivated individuals the environment and support they need and trust them to get the job done. You've gotta hire great UX workers and trust us to do our job. Principle nine, continuous attention to technical excellence and good design enhances agility. Design matters, make it great. And of course, my personal favorite, who doesn't love number 10? Simplicity, the art of maximizing the amount of work not done is essential. Because sometimes UX shows up and we say, wow, this is a bad idea, we shouldn't even be building it. And then everyone gets their underwear in a bunch because it's been funded and everyone's running with it. And so we would prefer if when we go to kill or change projects that there's an outpouring of love and support for that because thanks to principle 10, we want to minimize work for you that might be unnecessary. I have plenty of horror stories relating to that one, but for that you'd have to look up my horror story keynote called, let's not congratulate ourselves just yet. <laughs> it is on YouTube, it is a series of horror stories from working at the same job and the message is, 
oh my God, we shouldn't be able to call ourselves agile and do this. Um, so usually at this point, someone says, well, okay, Deb, then how do you reconcile safe with everything you're saying about UX's involvement? You've made UX sound really important and involved. Safe says you kind of don't need these people. What should we do? I find that most people who are looking to adopt SAFE have just had to ignore the part where they say you don't need UX experts because they say, we're empowering uh, agile teams to do their own lean UX. Well, that doesn't make sense. You, don't, you want to empower me to code? I have a degree in music. So uh, someone sent me an article yesterday that SAFE uh, posted saying, oh, maybe we should have lean UX centers of excellence and have these people more involved. And I say, yeah, keep, keep swimming, guys. I'm, I'm catching up. Uh, so unfortunately, SAFE and, and uh, UX don't reconcile fantastically, but if you love SAFE, you know, like other things in our lives, take the pieces you like and throw away the pieces you don't. Uh, stories. You don't know what this is. You can't tell who this is. I've put strategically placed clouds so you don't know who this is, but it's a famous tech company, and last year they had to announce that they're going to redesign their redesign. Because when they released it to the, to the paying public and the non-paying public, they learned that as for their new features, nobody liked them, nobody wanted them, everybody hated them. And it was so serious that even their blog had to announce that they really messed this one up and they were going to undo it and, and fix it. Anybody know who this is without yelling it out? Hand raise, anybody? A couple of people? So yeah, this is a well-known product. So, how much did this company spend on all of those designs, all of those engineers to test and bu build and test and release this for multiple platforms? I found someone who was in my audience who knew something about this team and he said tens of millions of dollars that they now have to undo or change in some way because of how poorly this was received. And think about that the money they could have saved if they had pivoted. And I can tell that they must have skimped on UX here because we can know upfront. We don't have to release these things and be surprised. We shouldn't just build it, just ship it, and then find out when TechCrunch writes about us that it was a disaster. There's so much that companies could be saving. Time, money, staff resources, customer agony, by working more with UX, because we would have known at a zillion points if you had let us research the market to see what they wanted. Design something, prototype it, take that prototyping to testing. Hey. People don't like this. It's not what they want for where we should go. We could have known at many points along the way. How am I doing? How am I doing, time guy? He's not even looking. He's having too much fun. Uh, so this is another poll. Um, so I'm going to activate it. And please get out your phones or your laptops or your psychic powers. And this, I'd like you to rate each of these five on how much do they affect the customer. How much, uh, on the far left, we've got customer doesn't care at all, and on the far right, we have furious custom, my, customer might leave our company or go to a competitor, or at least dream that they could. So let's see some votes here on uh, how bad these problems are for the customer, not for you or your boss or your spouse to have to listen to you complain. Is this working? People voting? People still thinking about it? It's a hard question. Whoa, yay, thank you. Okay, great. Five people. More. Let's get more. You can do it, people. Twenty people. Great. Every time I do this poll, this is exactly how it looks. Everybody understands that the first four have the power to kill a customer's experience and therefore drive them away, possibly into the waiting arms of a competitor. And they also recognize that the bottom one, which is a little bit more of an internal problem, it will affect customers. Maybe customers will have to wait longer for that new release. But it is not as direct a problem or a failure as the top four. And so you know from how you, probably how you voted in this poll, you know how much UX can make or break that, uh, that product and possibly your company. So, like good data people, we want to measure how it's working. So in addition to typical metrics of customer satisfaction, which is what I really want to drive home for people, is we can't just measure these things in the same old ways with efficiency, productivity, and velocity. We should also be looking at customer satisfaction. But if we want to measure some of the goals that DevOps tends to have, we certainly can. For example, how are things going before and after your UX revolution with respect to estimation? 
I would imagine that when people are estimating their time, if you're not doing the Kanban thing and it's a little bit more flowy, but for people doing more agile thing or time-based things, that the estimations would be more accurate when engineers can work from UX designs versus somebody saying, hey, here's this thing we're thinking of building, how long is it going to take? So I would think that would get more accurate and hopefully lead to better efficiency. Of course, if UX is providing blueprints and they're being followed, then engineering should hopefully have less work due to surprise changes and rebuilds. And we want to get things out to the public more quickly and more often. That sounds great, but we don't want to continuously deploy pieces of junk. And, uh, and so finally, I also want to remind people again that especially considering people with accessibility needs, we need to make sure we're designing and testing for all of our customers, and that way we can pass something to engineering that's truly ready to go and hopefully augmenting these goals. So a few last slides as we're down to five minutes on improving collaboration and culture, since those tend to suffer the most. So let's say your specialized database programmer is a bottleneck right now. Too many stories looking for this person's uh, work. So what do we do? Well, typically solutions might include pair programming, creating a sp skills matrix so that this is better balanced in the future, maybe some early testing to get some feedback back quickly, and maybe you're just stuck adding another developer to the team. But here's what you don't do. Nobody expects that specialized programmer to teach their specialty to other people on the team. But I read a book on Scrum that said your UX designer was going to be a bottleneck, so you should have her teach everybody on the team how to do her job. Well, good news. I studied some basic language programming in 1979. Who remembers 1979? Thank you, people my age. And uh, obviously, because I did a little basic programming in 1979, I must, I must have the heart of a coder. Right? So uh, probably the best thing is to send me to a three-day boot camp and then have me code to production, right? That would be a good idea. Like, I got a thumbs up from somebody, that means I've got a job. <laughs> so we, we know that when we flip it around for you guys and say, hey, would you like a classically trained opera singer to take a three-day boot camp and then code to production, you go, oh, God, sweet Jesus, no. But it's the same way we feel when someone says, hey, I just read a book about UX and I can do your job now. So ha ha uh, heads up, it doesn't work. Uh, some quick tips, assign UX to tickets and assign them in the system that you use. Don't make us a Trello board if you're in JIRA. Bring us into your system and collaborate with us uh, so that everything can be documented. And uh, I love when I get that because then I know it's going to be a collaboration and someone knows it's my job to fix. At every job I work at, I try, if I'm awake, because uh, there's time zone differences, uh, I try to answer an engineer's uh, ambiguity within two minutes because I'm your bottleneck. And if I say, ah, I'll answer him tomorrow, then I'm not your bottleneck, I'm an asshole. So <laughs> I'm out there at UX conferences telling them stop doing that, shoot self in foot. Invite UX to stand-ups, retro meetings, showcases, everything that could possibly involve UX, especially where the work is being shown, since there will be challenge questions and nobody's more qualified to answer them than I am. You wouldn't want me to speak to your work when you weren't there, let me speak for my work and don't make that decision without me. Who saw this one? This is going around. This was the Department of Defense put out a document on how to recognize agile BS, which I have to translate for my international audiences. And this is a flow chart in the document. You can Google this. It is not classified and not even redacted. And basically, there's a few things they want to make sure you are doing in an agile organization. And I'll read you these flow chart diamonds quickly. Are teams delivering working software to at least some subset of real users every iteration, including the first, and gathering feedback? Hey, Deb, that sounds like UX research and testing. Why, yes, it does. Thanks for asking. <laughs> Is feedback from users turned into concrete work items for sprint teams on timelines shorter than one month? And my favorite, are teams empowered to change the requirements based on feedback? Of course, that's my favorite one. I would love to be changing requirements if my user research and testing shows that people really don't want what we're planning to build. And even, so maybe you don't want to uh, agree with the Department of Defense on everything, but I've got to agree with this. And I've got one minute left, so I'm gonna have to zoom through some of my last slides. 
Uh, so very quickly, uh, you may have tried UX at your company or what you thought was UX, but of course, if I found out what you did, I would say this word you keep using, I do not think it means what you think it means. So time to try uh, UX again, and this time uh, do it right, do it better, because we want the bed to be empty because the patient recovered. And so uh, UX specialists are here to drive uh, teams to remind you to measure metrics outside of your typical software dev metrics and look at the human side, your customers and what their experience is because the path to getting your DevOps out of the ICU and seeing improved results, great product and happy customers is that complete and correct integration of UX specialists and processes. We're here to help you achieve your goals. And they look like this. And that's it. And uh, so if you like that, it also comes in convenient book form, now available on Amazon, Kindle, and paperback, uh, Kindle Unlimited, uh, because I'm cheap. And um, I only have one with me. You can't have it. Please order it online. And if you like the two-day version, you can ask me about that as well. I think I have like negative two minutes, but I'll try to take a question if there's any time left. And thank you for coming and staying. Do we have a question? Thank you for the warm round of applause. <laughs> All right, that was awesome. I think we might have coined like Dev uh, Ux Ops, Dev UX Ops, maybe. I think that might be a new thing, so we might have a conference for that next year. Some, someone <laughs> said just call it Dev Ops. Dev, de oh, <laughs> Dev Ops, I like that. That's awesome. Uh, someone else came up with that, so I can't take credit, but then I would have to explain that one too. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for speaking. That yeah. was awesome, thank and we're now on our next break, guys. Thanks. <laughs>